Welcome to Island Baptist Church. Today's Bible study is entitled, Where Do We Go From Here? Lesson 5. Welcome, welcome. Continuing in our study of where do we go from here. I've been talking about the book, Where Do We Go From Here? If you haven't gotten this book, you need to get this book. I'd recommend it. It goes a lot further detail than what I'm doing. Uh, again, very grateful for Dr. Jeremiah. He didn't give me permission to preach his stuff. I'm just doing it anyway, but I figure it's, you know, I don't take credit for his stuff. And so unless I, unless it's, if I speak something that isn't accurate, then we'll, you know, that's me. But everything is accurate. We'll put it on him. But this is good stuff. You really need. It's well researched. It's well done, and uh, highly recommend it to you. His sermon series on this also, as well, is is excellent and just such a needed word. I think for our our entire nation, our our Christians, especially obviously, uh, our churches really need to hear uh, the things he got to say. Praise God. He's got he's got a, he's got a uh, a global. He's got a national voice and a global voice. He was talking in one of them. I can't remember what the statistics were, but how many more people now are listening to him online and through radio or whatever uh, since COVID? Because a lot of people, you know, got closed up at home and, you know, people don't come listen to me because they don't know who I am. But everybody, oh, Dr. David Miramile, let's go listen to him. Well, that's a, he's a great guy to get connected with. Uh, if we're going to get locked down again for some weird reason, well, let's, you know, let's make sure he's on your docket. I, my, my goal as a pastor is not to make sure that you hear everything I've got to say even though, I, you know, I don't tend to give you anything that's wrong, but make sure that we are connected and addicted to good preaching, good Bible teaching. I don't care who does it. Uh, and, and you will also find that I will not be happy if you're connected to not good Bible teaching. And, but I will, I will get in your business. So just say, uh-uh, don't. That person is up to, you know. Uh, and I've had to do that with some over, over the years. And... Uh, because, again, what's, what's our point? Our point is to go and grow in Christ and to be as strong as we possibly can be as a church. The body of Christ is more than the Island Baptist Church. It's more than the gifts of Island Baptist Church. We depend mostly upon our gifts within here because, obviously, day to day, uh, that's, that's how it works. But, but the glo more global things become, well, the, the good side of globalism is that we can depend on the international church. The international church, the national church, the international church has so much to offer, so many different cultures and races and languages and other things, and, boy, uh, the giftedness of the body of Christ within that realm is is uh, uh, amazing, um, I believe, for sure. So we're going to be looking tonight, uh, on, like I said, ongoing in this study. Tonight we're going to be looking at apostasy. What is that? How is that? And how does that affect us? And what does it mean for our future? What does it mean for the future of our churches? Uh, how, how does it happen? And as I go through this, if, if you're like me, you're going to hear some things that, that are going to be said, they're going to connect with you, experiences you've had with people uh, in churches, and uh, it'll help hopefully under, help you understand uh, some of those experiences, and then also understand where we're headed together. So let's pray together, and uh, then we're going to get started. Mm -hmm. God, I thank you uh, for this series. We thank you for Dr. David Jeremiah and for his faithfulness to preach your word, and as I endeavor to bring some of the ideas that he's brought, Lord, and add some of my own to it, we ask God, that you would graciously attend all these things so that, um, so that what comes out and what we hear is from you. God, we know that your Holy Spirit is directing us here, and we thank you again for our time of fellowship, both over food and now over your word, and we pray your blessings over all of it. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So imagine writing a book when you're 22 years old and watching it land on the bestsellers list. This is what happened, uh, in fact, not just one place, many places. You may have heard of the book uh, if you were anybody college students in the 90s. Anybody? Probably not. There was a book called A Kissed Dating Goodbye, uh, and uh, Pastor Greg, I know, is familiar with it. I'm familiar with it. It's a great, great book, and this is a young man that wrote about dating and what the Bible had to say about it, and it was a great book, very influential over the 90s and early 2000s, uh, young people who were considering relationships and what, what a Christian relationship ought to look like. And, and uh, anyway, this, this man who wrote this book at 22, like I said, laying on the bestseller lift in the middle, middle of the 90s, and then he became a pastor after that uh, speaking and writing career, remained as a pastor for almost two decades. Uh, over time, though, his uh, faith began to evaporate. And uh, 2019, he came out and publicly announced that his marriage was about to end in divorce. And then he followed that with a very troubling announcement. And this is what he said. This was his own words. 
He says, I have undergone a massive shift in my faith in Jesus. The biblical phrase, he says, is falling away. He uses those exact terms. We're going to learn that term. It's an accurate term. By all measures, he says, for defining a Christian, he said, I am not a Christian anymore. So, wow. So, two decades of being a pastor and writing some very successful books and having successful ministry and then turning his back, not just on the church. I understand getting mad at people, but I don't understand turning your back on Christ. What is that? And this is happening more and more to those who claim Christ and who have even had a, some ministry at some point. What, what is this? This is, what, like I said, he accurately defines it. It's called the falling away, apostasy. It's not just people getting mad and quitting coming to church for a couple of years or getting upset with some person who in the church should have acted differently. It's not that. It's something different. Recent op-ed said it this way. Everyone is leaving Christianity. Of course, that isn't true, but nonetheless, they said that. Everyone's leaving Christianity, and nobody knows where they're going, it says. Quote, unquote. What's happening so often is this new word. In fact, there's so many who are seeming to do this, they've coined a new, a new term. Instead of calling themselves evangelicals, they call themselves ex-vangelicals. So does that bother you? Well, it should. It should. It's, it's, it's disturbing. What is this all about? And has, does the Bible have anything to say about it? This falling away is, as we're going to see, not a new phenomenon. In fact, it is as old as the disciples, I should say. One of the twelve, remember, fell away. What happened to Judas? He's the poster child uh, for this movement, if you will. He fell away. Throughout history, there have been those who have taken on the name of Jesus, the title of Christianity, only to lay it down and never to pick it up again. It's disturbing. Uh, we find this in the New Testament. Even in the first century, we find people working in ministry. Here's some examples here. Uh, there it is. So here's Paul in two different places, both Colossians and Philemon, referring to one guy by the name of Demas. Notice our friend, he's just referring to, you know, he's at the end of these books saying these are the guys who were along with me. In some cases, they were helping him write the books. Our dear friend Luke, the doctor who writes, of course, Acts in the book of Luke, and Demas send greetings, so that's who were present there as he's signing off on this book in Colossians. And then in the book of Philemon, he says, Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, sends you greetings, as do Mark, of course, the writer of the book of Mark. Aristarchus, the name mentioned in other places in the New Testament. Demas, there it is again, Luke, the same Luke, my fellow workers, he calls them. But then eight or ten years later, maybe a little bit more, maybe more like 15 years later, he writes this in 2 Timothy, this is his last book that he writes, he ends the book of 2 Timothy in a very sad note. Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and gone to Thessalonica. Now, it's hard to say, did he just have a bad day, or is this actually a fallen away? But it seems to picture something that is a little bit stronger than just, you know, kind of losing heart. He lost more than that, I think, there. So Jude is also a book that is devoted to this topic, written by Jesus' half-brother. Of course, Jesus' half-brothers to James and Jude, in case you don't know that. That's, they were both born to Mary and Joseph. So Jude writes about even the fact of, we, we don't really take into account, maybe sometimes we don't want to hear this, but he writes about the fact, and, and if I mention this, you're going to know this, but like I said, we don't like to think this way, that even angels fell away. They saw the face of God. So, so if those who always beheld the face of God could fall away, is it possible that those, some of us, could fall away? In fact, the New Testament, the book of Revelation, gives us a, a percentage. It said a full one-third fell to the deception of Satan, of angels. We don't know what the original number is, because we don't know, we know a percentage, not a number, but still, that's disturbing. It should be. It seems like we read more and more about those who are walking away from their faith, and statistics are not good. Uh, just up and coming, here's some statistics for our churches and for our culture, not necessarily statistics of the f official falling away, but they are not, they are disturbing as overall in, in, in speaking of our churches here in the United States. 72 million millennials in the USA today, that's a full one quarter of our whole population. Full one quarter of our population was born from 1982 to 2000, that's the millennial uh, age. These, these young people, or I guess they're not that young anymore, uh, increasing large percentage are walking away from their faith. I know this is probably not shocking to you, you're probably familiar with this, but 
Uh, again, what is the statistics on this? They identify themselves as religious, religiously speaking, as the nuns. N O N E S, not N U N S. But the nuns, as in none, none for me. Some for you, but none for me. And the reason why they call themselves nuns is, for instance, you're listed on uh, different forms and applications. They would ask you what faith you are. You're Catholic, or you're Baptist, or you're Methodist, or you're Presbyterian, or down below it says none of the above. And that's the way they say, we're nuns. And it's a movement among the millennials in particular. The nuns. 2008, a third of millennials described themselves religiously as unaffiliated. 2018, a solid 10 years later, 42%. So it's getting worse. Just unaffiliated. Just, we don't go anywhere. Don't participate in anything. Church membership has suffered decades-long de declines. You're no doubt familiar with this. 1980s, it was 70% of Americans who were members of churches. Uh, 2000, it was 65%. 2010, it was 59%. And then today, it's 40, 47%. Of Americans. Now, this is, of course, corresponding also in church attendance, not just church membership. So, in other words, where we were to where we are today is downhill. And uh, that probably doesn't shock you. And this isn't necessarily a statistic on the actual what it means to fall away. The biggest issue, like I said, is not falling out with church, getting mad at somebody, or getting mad at some preacher. People do that. This is not the issue. The issue is turning your back on Christ. You've probably known people that have gotten mad at a church or a preacher or something like that, but when you talk to them, they're like, oh no, we love Jesus, we just hate the church because of what they did. I understand that. Do you understand that? People in church can be bad. I've seen it. I've experienced it. But turning your back on Christ, it's altogether a different thing. That's a different category completely. People who have gone on record to say, that they have turned their backs on the biblical Jesus. The Hebrews, book writer of Hebrews, actually, in fact, you'll find the New Testament, which you're going to see, has a ton to say about this particular group. And I want us to hear and collect, collect this information so that we can understand and put a finger on what's really going on and what's really happening around us and those that we love. How much more severely do you think someone who deserves to be punished who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? If you read the previous chapter and the previous couple of chapters of Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews is writing to a group of people who are very close to being Christians, but maybe haven't crossed over the line. They're associating with Christians, they're running with the Christians, they're doing what Christians do, and yet he holds out this possibility that they haven't actually crossed the line of conversion yet. He writes about them in chapter 6, but it seems like somebody can lose their salvation. There is no such thing. You cannot lose your salvation. I wrote a whole book on it in case you want to refer to it, but let me just simply save you a lot of trouble and not too good a writing. Just simply say, it can't happen. It's impossible. Since you didn't get it because you were a good person, you can't lose it because you're a bad person. It's ridiculous. Jesus saved you. You didn't save yourself. If you saved yourself, you're not saved anyway. And so, yeah, that salvation you can lose all the time. But since Jesus saved you, since you're not the one holding on to yourself, since it's heaven's not, heaven is holding on to you, you can let go all you want. It won't let go of you. So once saved, always saved. We believe in the perseverance of the saints. Absolutely. Why? Because we like that? No, because the Bible teaches it very, very clearly. So anyway, the writer of Hebrews is not referring to somebody who's lost their salvation. He's refer, referring to somebody who came very close. So it's not that they backslid, they never slid far enough to begin with, forward. So they came so close, they saw all these things, they saw the miracles and the power of God and the changed lives, and yet they themselves never crossed the line, officially. Who's to say? Who's to say this one is and this one isn't? Well, no one is. The time will tell, though, because the Bible says, that, again, the saints persevere and the ain'ts don't. You're either a saint or you're an ain't. And how do we know? Well... Time will tell. How much more severe do you think those who trampled underfoot the Son of God, who was treated as unholy, the things, the, the blood of the covenant that sanctified them, who has insulted the Spirit of grace? The, the writer of Hebrews sets up this situation, describes them as unreachable. You can't turn them around. It's a scary thing. Seems to, seems to say that. So, Again, let's consider. Uh, again, Judas is just, just to underscore how uh, not prevalent, but how powerful and serious this sect of Christianity is, if we could call it that. If you'll remember, Judas is the poster child for all this stuff, and he's the best example of someone falling away from Christ. 
uh, someone who was a part of the inner 12, someone who had the best testimony, saw the, all the miracles, saw all the testimony, saw the workings of miracles through his own life in the lives of others, ministers on behalf of Christ. And yet he turns his back on Jesus. So, so, so here's a sobering notion for us. This unbelief exists in the closest and most dear areas of belief. If it was among the 12, it is among us. I'm not trying to scare you. This is not a witch hunt. <laughs> I'm just saying, if you expect unbelief to only be, and someone turns their back on Christ, to only be outside the church, you're in for some serious disappointment. Because Judas of the 12, of the inner circle, if Jesus couldn't reach and keep Judas, there will be some who will come into our fellowship that we will not be able to keep either. They will turn. The Bible predicts that there's coming a day and there's coming a, a, a movement of turning from Christ within the church, from within the church, that's going to be massive. It's going to be large, not going to be small scale. And again, these, this is a big issue, and it's a part of the end times events that we haven't discussed, at least in, in thoroughly, and nor, most people don't understand. So what does this mean for us? Well, let me just say a couple of things. This, the word apostasy, which is the word that, we've been, that I've used and we're going to continue to use, but we need to make sure we under, under, understand it. Apostasy, when I was growing up, was defined as men with long hair and women with short hair and short skirts. That was apostasy, you know, and dancing, and card playing. And it was, it was an apostasy in the sense that it was, it was turning away from our cultural norms of the way I was raised. But it's not apostasy in a biblical sense. And uh, or hanging out with those whose beliefs don't perfectly line up with you. Um, we were, I mean, we, we couldn't hang out with the Church of Christ, the Methodists. I mean, those are all, you know, horrible, evil people. You know, they're not Baptists, and they don't go to Baptist church that you go to, and they don't preach the King James Version then, wow, it's, they're apostates, they're, y'all were all raised in the same culture I was. If you went to church, you know, we all kind of had this, this attitude. That's a, not apostasy, biblically speaking. Apostasy is something altogether different, far more dangerous, far more serious, far more deadly. It is uh, not the same as atheism. To fall away means you had to be a part of. Does that make sense? So atheist, technically speaking, is not an apostate because he never believed, he never claimed to believe. There, he can't, you can't turn away from something that you never joined, if you will. Uh, he, he refused to ever believe and always has denied the gospel. That is not an apostate. Apostate is only a word that's applied to a very specific group of people. To people who claim to believe in and act as if though they are believers for a certain period of time, maybe for a very long time, but who eventually turn their backs on Christ. So the Greek word literally is only used twice in the New Testament, Acts chapter 12, 21, verse 21, and then a more significant, most significant place where you show it up here is in, in 2 Thessalonians chapter uh, 2, 1 through 3. And Paul, pretty much all of 2 Thessalonians is about the end times. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him. So that's two different events. One is the return of Jesus, ultimately the very end, and, and then the other one actually precedes it, which is our rapture, our carry, getting caught up out of here for those who trust in Christ. And our gathering together to him, we ask you not to soon be shaken in, in mind or troubled either by a spirit that is little s, by some, some attitude or some movement, or by a word, or by a letter, as if from us. Because some people were writing pseudepigraphy, which is just a big preacher word that I like to use to make you feel like you don't know as much as I do. <laughs> pseudepigraphy just means that they, 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 wrote, they wrote it, but they wrote it under somebody else's name. So somebody would write a letter trying to harm a church, and they would sign Paul's name. Well, nobody knew. They didn't have any kind of uh, signature detectives or whatever, so... It seemed like it was from Paul, it must be, and they would write stuff that would try to trouble the church. And Paul said, listen, don't listen to this stuff. Don't be shaken. As if though the day of Christ has come, let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come. Mark it carefully. This is critical you understand this. Unless the falling away comes first. There's the word, apostasy. That has to happen. And... The man of, is, of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. We call him the Antichrist, but he's only called that in the book of John, 1 John, 2 John. So Antichrist is a more, more common term. So you, these two things start, uh, happen before Jesus comes back. 
So uh, there's other things that happen, but these two things in particular he highlights there. And one can happen at the same time as another, and we're going to see that here in just a bit. The Bible's going to show us that. But apostate, by definition, is a, to be apostatized, is to fall away from, to desert a position you formerly held. A spiritual apostate occurs when a person who claimed to be a believer departs from what he formerly believed and professed. That's apostasy. So it can't be an atheist. It can't be a Hindu. It can't be a Muslim. They're not apostates. They're unbelievers, but they're not apostates. Apostate is one who, listen, was never saved, but in all per, all per, for all practical purposes seemed as if she was or if he was. They never slid far enough forward because you cannot slide out, as we already said. Every apostate is an unbeliever. But not every unbeliever is an apostate. Makes sense. I got a Muslim over here who was never claimed to be a Christian, and he's an unbeliever, but not an apostate. An apostate is a person who was a part of our church, is a part of our group, a part of our fellowship. We had no reason to think he or she was anything other than a believer. A person who's never heard uh, or heard and never professed belief, uh, just a believer in another religion, they are not apostates. Uh, you can not walk away from something that you were never a part of. And that is the definition, to walk away. You were in it, you were part of it, you were known for it, and then you walk away from it and you don't go back. An apostate is well acquainted with the gospel. They know it as well or maybe better than most of us in this room. And uh, they know more than enough to be saved and they just simply walk away from it. Ernest Hemingway said this, there are two ways to go bankrupt. You know what they are? Gradually and then suddenly. <laughs> and that's kind of the way apostate works. It's just gradual. It's kind of unseen. It's under the ground. And then all of a sudden, boom. It wasn't sudden. There was something building. Like I said, this young man who wrote this book and was a pastor for a long time, it was something building his heart for a very long time, and finally he just completely quit it. Uh, what does this mean, this theme of apostasy mean in the Bible? How does it reply to us? The proliferation of apostasy is important overlooked end time piece of the puzzle. We overlook it, but it, we'll find it almost every time a writer in the New Testament or Jesus speaks about the end time events. He speaks, they, they will add to this whole issue. There we have Paul right behind us saying this. Do you know that? See, we know about the Antichrist, we talk about that all the time. But what about the apostasy? What about the falling away? It's going to be something significant because of the way that the Bible handles it, and the writer of the New Testament. Handle it. We're going to see that. One of the signs of the end times is the rise of those who claim to be Christian. Turn their backs on Christ. Paul, again, explains it further here. Notice it's, it's, it is a, uh, the, it, it's, it's critical that you see this, the letter, the words the over there. That's called the definite article in the Greek. When it precedes something like this, especially when Paul writes this, because he's very, he's a, he's, he's a real good uh, he's a technician when it comes to writing the Greek language. When you see that, it's speaking about a very specific thing. It's not talking about just some generalized, oh, well, a lot people are, like, like the statistics I would give you, less people are coming to church than they were. Well, that's sort of general. No, this is something very specific. Just like the Antichrist, the, the man of sin is a very specific person. Likewise, the falling away is a very specific event coming in the end times, and it's going to be, it's going to be a major player. Uh, this is a prophecy about tomorrow that has implications upon us today. So falling away, is, is like I said, definite article is, is critical here. Uh, this will be a part of the tribulation period. Again, Antichrist, remember, is not necessarily, do, anti doesn't mean against Jesus. It just means in place of. The Greek could use it both ways. And most often when anti was used, it was used to mean to replace something. As opposed to in our language, we say, I'm anti this or I'm anti that. Oh, that means you're against it. Well, and it can mean that in the Greek language. And I'm not saying that this guy isn't necessarily anti Jesus, but he's more than anything in place of Jesus. So part of this falling away, especially as the falling away hits in the end time scenario, is that they're falling away. The, the, the unique apostasy is falling away to the unique man. They got a place to go now. Instead of you know, everybody's leaving Christianity, no one knows where to go. They're going to know where to go then. It's going to be this massive swing. And again, I say it massive because that's the way the writers, and in particular Jesus, uh, illustrates it. 
So not one thing has to happen for Jesus to come and get us at the rapture, but lots of things happen to happen among these, these are some of them, before Jesus comes in his second coming. We've already said that. Nevertheless, like I said, these things that we've been talking about are foreshadowings. The chip we talked about last time, is it the mark of the beast? Definitely not. How do we know? We don't have a beast. You ain't got a beast, you don't have a mark of the beast, right? So I, I will warn you that I wouldn't get one of those things unless you want to limit your freedoms quite substantially because they're going to be very powerful and they're going to, well, like I said, they, they have a lot of benefits. Uh, I tried to sell them to you last time and now the price has gone up. So it was 100 last week, now it's 300 and next week's going to be 5,000. So that's the way technology goes. So the chip, the worldwide pandemic are all foreshadowings. It's, this is not necessarily end time events, but there's certainly shadows being cast by something that is yet future that we need to take warning of. These kind of things are pointing to this socialism, all this stuff. Uh, what, what is it telling us? It's God, I believe, warning us about the things that are come. So the timeline of events, just to give you a rough outline, there's a lot more that could be filled in here. Number one is the rapture of the church. Number one. So how do we know the end time of end is here? Rapture of the church. When we're going up and I say, see, I told you. That's how you know. <laughs> Pastor, is this it? Well, what do you think? We're a thousand feet off the ground. This, yeah, that's definitely it. No, it no, but I will rub your nose in it, just so you know. No. <laughs> the rapture of the church, number one, the rise of the Antichrist and the apostasy, and I see those things as being almost simultaneous. They could be. Because you rapture the church out of here, you remove the light of the church, you immediately have a collapse in society. You have a moral collapse, you have financial collapse. I mean, the church globally has done, has props up so much, has for centuries and centuries and centuries. We've been the light and the salt. You take away the light and the salt, and man, things get nasty. And they get, they get, they get dark, and they get putrid really, really fast. And so that's what's going to happen. So you have this collapse of a system that has been propped up by the church. You also have, uh, and, and you, you have to be able to explain what happened to these people. So you give another, another impulse to the rise of this sinful one, this, this uh, perverse one whom the Bible predicts. So, and the apostasy, well, that happens also in the midst of it, because you have a bunch of people who are true believers that, are le that leave, but then maybe a third of the church is still here. Pastors still preaching on Sundays. What's happened? They've got to explain these people away. Who are they? What are they? Who are these people that have been left behind? And what happens to them? So, and then, of course, the, the Antichrist makes a covenant with Israel for seven years, starting the Great Tribulation. He breaks the covenant three and a half year interval. Uh, then, and then we have the second coming of Jesus, which is precisely at the end of those seven years. All these things have to take place before Christ's return, order of events. And they could all start immediately, and, or they could be way down the road, but I, I've been laying out to you, or we, I should say, Dr. Jeremiah and myself, I'm on behalf of him, I've been laying out to you how these things are already in place. We've already got them. It's just a matter of a few things coming together, and boom, we could be, we could be right in the midst of uh, times about which the Bible has more to say than it does about any other thing in all of history, including the first coming of Christ. So we keep hearing a lot about television preachers, and uh, I don't know, I've, I've been bothered for many years reading the Bible and watching these television preachers and not, not, maybe not understanding everything that they were talking about, but I've always been bothered, bothered because these TV evangelists, it seems like they're one of their major themes in addition to health and wealth, is that the greatest times of the church are coming. Because I couldn't find that in the Bible. Every, the illustration I see in the scriptures constantly is that we're headed downhill, not uphill. Now, I want, there to be, I want them to be right. I, do I want a revival? Absolutely. I'll be the first to second that motion. If you want to bring up the motion, I'm in favor of it. Absolutely. Let's do it. I want to see the church revive. I want to see the church change. I want to see the church progress. But the, you hear them all talk about it. Get on the glory wagon. We're headed to great times. The Bible teaches the exact opposite. The Bible says we're not headed to good times. We're headed to really bad times. In fact, the worst times... The worst, if you studied with us, if you were here last year, we studied the seven letters of seven churches. The final age of the church is the apostasy church. It's the age of the Laodicean church in which they are healthy, they're wealthy, they're well healed in so many areas, and yet Jesus is on the outside of the church knocking to get in. You do not know that you are depraved and you are wicked and you are naked and you are blind and you're sick, he says to them. So Jesus is even on the outside of this church. That's the age, ladies and gentlemen, that, in my opinion, where we are. And it's going to get deeper. We're going to get further and further into it. So this age of apostasy, this 
age of uh, feeling good about Jesus, but that Jesus doesn't exist. And already the feel-good preachers are preaching a Jesus who doesn't require you to uh, accept the wretchedness of your sinful nature and to repent of those sins and to turn in faith in Christ, else you'd be thrown into hell. You don't hear that anymore. So, so who are they preaching about? That Jesus doesn't exist. Because that's exactly the way Jesus preached it. Repentance. The kingdom of heaven is here. Repent, 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 repent. You're a sinner. He wouldn't let you go on any of that. That Jesus doesn't exist, but these preachers are leading tons of people to him every day. Who are they accepting? Who are they following? They call him Jesus. They come to our churches. They're growing churches in our, in our nation and other places larger than any other churches have ever existed in the history of Christianity. Tremendous churches, thousands upon thousands upon thousands of mem membership, gigantic ministries. And I'm not saying that these necessarily are bad, every single one person and all that, and that every situation is in there, but it begs the question, I've, I've asked that many times to myself and to this congregation, so if we, we are, our churches are bigger than they've ever been, why is our influence so poor? The church has the smallest influence over the United States of America as we've ever had. Speaking of Baptists, and I, you know, I know we have other denominations here, but we Baptists, we, we started the Southern Baptist Convention because we didn't have any other choice. We had to band together as churches. This would have been considered a very large church in the days when the Southern Baptist Convention was 150 people, 200 people on a Sunday morning. That was a massive church. That was a mega church. Typical church was 25, 30 Half the people were barefooted in it. I got pictures of my family in a little bitty church in the middle of East Texas. The little, they called them hard shell Baptists because they, they did three ordinances. They did the Lord's Supper, they did baptism, and they washed feet every single Sunday. Why did they do it? Because a lot of people showed up without shoes. It was just the way it was. These, these little bitty churches with these small congregations that banded together, and it was true for Methodists and others, Presbyterians and others, had massive influence over our culture. Now we got tens of thousands of people attend, attending churches and all kinds of money flowing all kinds of places. And man, our culture, it, where's the salt and light? Salt has lost the saltiness and the light's been put out. It's under a bushel somewhere. Because even though we got all these people going to churches, they have no influence over our culture. In fact, if anything, if they're the influence over our culture, then the church must be wicked. Just the math. you got here's the influencers and here's the way this, the culture is. And so if... If the culture is this way, then that tells me the mass says the equation says that this equation isn't adding up. Something's not right over here. There's a problem, and there, there definitely is. So, so this Jesus that's being preached by these feel-good preachers, he doesn't exist. He doesn't require you to repent of your sins. He doesn't re require you to, to, to deny yourself. Who is this Jesus? He's not in the Bible, but people are placing their faith in him all the time. These are the groups that are coming, I, I believe. They're going to be a part of this apostasy. Never, never put their faith in the actual Christ. If you believe the wrong, if you believed in the wrong, wrong thing, you believe the wrong person. If you didn't believe the right stuff. The Bible does predict there's going to be an incredible revival in the tribulation. That's after the rapture, after the period of the Antichrist, after the covenant he makes with Israel. There's going to be a massive revival. In fact, it speaks of that in Revelation 7. After these things, he's Paul, this is John writing, he says, I looked, and behold, a great multitude, which no one could number of all nations and tribes and peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes, with palm branches in their hands. This is chapter 7, so we, tribulation is already well underway. Who are these people? Well, John is just, he's not asking any questions at this point. John's had it pretty rough. But an elder, or one of the angels actually, who who's teaching these things, come up to him and ask him. Actually, I think, it's, I think it's one of the elders. Comes up to him and says, do you know who these people are? And John says, no, you know, tell me. And so he tells them here in uh, verse 14. He said to me, these are the ones who come out of the great tribulation washed and, and washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. That same chapter tells us there's 144,000 Jews who apparently are evangelists going out into all the world. Imagine 144,000 Apostle Pauls, these guys never get married. They're just there to serve God. 144,000 anointed by God during this seven-year tribulation period. So, yeah, it's a terrible period. Lots of people are dying. Lots of people are being saved. Lots of people are being rescued. And, again, we have that testimony here. Again, this is not, though, the church age. 
The church age ends with the rapture of the church. The church is gone. This is the tribulation age. Very short, but not sweet, to be sure. Uh, but John tells us between now and that time before the tribulation, it tells us this about those who were part of us. The Antichrist is coming. That's the official the, right? The definite article. And even now, many Antichrists notice without the definite article. So a lot of liars are out there. The big liars coming. There's a lot of little liars out there talking, telling us different things, telling us a different Jesus. They have come by which we know that this is the last hour. Then they went out from us. Who are they? These preachers, these teachers, these supposed Christians, they went out from us. So they had to be the part of us to begin with, didn't they? But they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would have continued with us, and they went out so out that they might be made manifest that none of them were of us, he says. Wow. Sobering words. So where does the apostate come from? He comes from the church. That's where he comes from. He's a part of us. He's a part of us. So let's turn to Matthew chapter 24 now. We've heard Paul on it. We've had uh, John on it. And we've, now let's hear what Jesus has to say. We've read through this. We've seen this before. But have we really paid attention? Matthew chapter 24. Jesus again lines up these signs of the times, the end times in particular, has this personal discourse, this Olivet discourse with his disciples on the Mount of Olives overlooking the temple. And they say, when will these things be in the destruction of the temple? And Jesus lines out uh, six different things that are going to take place, warning signs, uh, rumblings, uh, birth pangs, as we call them, or as he calls them. Verse 24, verse uh, 5 through, through 14. Chapter 24, verses 4, verse 4, I got to get, okay. Chapter 24, verses 5 through 14, I'm getting all my numbers messed up here. Jesus answered and said, see to it that no one misleads you. Why? Because that's going to be a problem. Because why? Because there you go. You notice that the, the, the agreement of scriptures is just 100% across the board. Liars, liars, liars. They're going to tell, tell the truth. What, what is a lie? So if I, if, if I held up a $20 Monopoly bill and tried to cash it down here at Stripes, would that work? It's a lie, right? But it's not a very good one. Right? I mean, who would take that? Unless you're blind, and you can even then fill of it and say, it's not the right size, it doesn't feel the right texture. But if you have a professional counterfeiter, and you're the lady behind the counter, are you going to know what a $20 bill, counterfeit $20 bill looks like? Unless you're trained. Unless you have one of those little marker pens that they mark things with, and that's only when things are going south, you know, they, they but, but man, you could pass $20 bills like nothing, because people don't really know. That's the, the, the $20 monopoly money is not what you need to be afraid of. It's a $20, $20 a well done uh, uh, counterfeit. Those are the things that are passing and causing huge problems and debasing our currency and, you know, all that stuff. It's the, it's the closeness of it, because where do they come from? It's our churches, not from the Muslims. I'm not saying the Muslims aren't a problem. I'm not saying the Hindus aren't a problem. I'm not saying, you know, the, the, the strange religions that are out there are not a problem. The Antichrist, though, the, the real bad ones are the ones that come out of the midst of us. They're the real wolves. They're far more dangerous because they're capable of taking with them because they carry our reputation. Oh, he's one of the people there at the Island Baptist Church. We can trust him. Not necessarily. Oh, he was saved under Pastor Bill's preaching. He must be a good guy. Not necessarily. He, I've known him all his life. He's a good kid. Well, not necessarily. Time will tell. So, so let's keep reading here. So he says, For many will come in my name and say, I am the Christ, and mislead many. Notice he's not saying I'm against Christ. I'm the Christ. It's, it's important you understand that. You'll be hearing of wars and rumors of wars. So here's these, these things that are happening. First the Antichrist, then wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not frightened. For those things must take place. That is not yet the end, for nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. Can you see this? Yeah, we're seeing it all around us. Various places, there will be famines and earthquakes, and all these things are merely the beginnings of birth pangs. You're just having just mild little issues there, sister. It's going to get way worse. And they deliver you to tribulations. There's another thing that's got to happen. They will kill you. You'll be hated by all nations on account of me, and at that time, many will fall away. Here we go. 
and will deliver up one another and hate one another. How can you fall away if you're not at first apart? See, now Jesus is, Now we have Jesus on this. This is, this is a, a classically important part of the whole end time scenario. This mass has fallen away. I believe we're leading up to it. Why? Because we've got these guys, like I said, preaching a false Jesus, leading us down a wrong path. This fall away, they, they believed in a Jesus who's fake. By the way, a fake Jesus is far easier to believe in. Because he appeals to your sinful nature. This Jesus will tell you he wants you to build up your self-esteem. Not the New Testament Jesus. This Jesus tells you that he exists to make you happy. Not the New Testament Jesus. He's here to make you money. He's here to say, he says it's all about you. And the world is your apple and you're to take a bite of it. He's far easier to believe in. Can you agree? Than the Jesus who says, deny yourself in this world you'll have trouble. But be a good cheer, I've overcome the world. As Jesus says that you're, you're a washed up sinner bound for hell and you have no hope apart from the grace of God. I mean, these are hard things to accept. Much easier to say, I'm awesome, I just need a little help. So, so, so these people are accepting a Jesus who does not exist. Again, Paul, back to Paul, warns us, uh, warns Paul, warns Timothy about these things and warns us at the same time. The Spirit expressly says, how can you say that more seriously? It's like, that's some sober words right there. Does he need to say that since he's writing the New Testament? I mean, really? He's doubling down here because there's going to be a tendency for Timothy, first of all, and for us also to think, ah, that can't really happen. When you find the Spirit doubling down in the, in the Bible, you really need to say, oh, it must be a, re- it must be a reason for this because why does he need to overemphasize something when it's just in, already in the Bible? Like it's already written in the stars. Why do I need to see it more clearly? So the Spirit expressly says that in the later times, latter times, some will depart from the faith. There you have it. Again, no shocker. It shouldn't be. Because to, to depart from the faith, it means you had to have been a part of the faith, at least seemingly so. Giving heed to deceiving spirits, doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. They preach, they teach, they follow their own way. Uh, one of the most, the biggest ones, I, Oprah Winfrey, you know her? She's Christian. And now she very clearly says she's not. She does not, does not agree with, she does, does not like the God of the Bible, she does not the Jesus of the Bible. She has a Jesus, but he doesn't exist. She's invented him. She's very powerful. She's very powerful. They, and, and it doesn't bother her a bit that she speaks out against what your scriptures say. It doesn't bother her. She doesn't have conscience about that at all. So here's Paul warning Timothy in his first letter and then now in the second letter. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. Where do you get sound doctrine? From the Bible. Only. But according to their own desires, like I said, I, I want somebody to tell me I'm awesome. So tell me about the Jesus that says I'm awesome. I like that Jesus. So eventually you start crying out for that for enough, you're going to get that Jesus. They have itching ears, it says. They will heap up for themselves teachers, and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to myths. This myth Jesus has a great following today. He really does. Again, why are our churches so large and yet have so little influence? Because I would suggest to you many are not saved, not truly converted. Because this myth, Jesus, is powerful and very well accepted. So some fall away because they were deceived about Jesus. Others fall away because they're disillusioned. We saw in Luke 8, Jesus tells us a parable of, that explains this reason. Let's, let's go there, Luke chapter 8. So there's Matthew 24. Let's go to Luke, Luke chapter 8. The parable of the sower here, and this is the shorter version of it, but, but it is a very, very good version. We're going to consider it here. Chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. He gives us four different types of those who accept the seed. Two, or I should say three of the four, are unsaved. Only one is saved. It is not an accurate teaching of this to say that three or two of these are saved and one of them isn't. That's not true. Because, again, everywhere else in the New Testament says fruitfulness or the fruit, you'll know them by what? By their fruit. So if they don't produce fruit, what are they? They never had roots. Never accepted the seed. 
But they look like they did. Well, let's, let's see. Jesus tells the best story, so let's, let's read it. Verse, uh, where did I tell you? Yeah, chapter 8, verses 4 through 15. And when a great multitude had come together, and those who were various cities were journeying with him, to him, he spoke by way of parable, saying, The sower went out to sow his seed, and he sowed, and some fell beside the road, and it was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air ate it up. And other seed fell on rocky soil. As soon as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And other seed, here's the third group, still not saved. And other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it out. The other seed fell into a good soil and grew up and produced a crop a hundred times as great. And he said to these things, he who has an ear, let him hear. Uh, and then it's going to go on to, uh, to explain what they are down here in the following verses. Disciples being questioned, he says, what are this parable? What might it be? And he says, to you it has been granted to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to the rest it is given in parables, so that seeing they may not see. This is a judgment for him. He's judging them, not giving them straight answers, because they've gotten straight answers up to this point and still said he's doing this by the power of Satan. So he starts speaking to them in parables as a judgment. Seeing they may not see, hearing they may not hear and understand, now the parable is this, the seed is the word of God, and the, those beside the road are those who heard, and then the devil comes along and takes away the word from their hearts, so they just simply never accepted it, they never part of your church, never had anything to fall away from because they were never joined or anything like that, so that, that they may not believe and be saved, so he just simply doesn't say they remain in this condition necessarily, just says that the, when they heard it, they didn't, didn't hit them. And those on the rocky soil are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. So it's an emotional thing. How, how can we know when a person actually accepts Christ? Well, we can't. Somebody says, how, how do you know when a person that comes to Jesus? I say, well, they tell me they do. Don't we have a better test than that? No, we don't. Time is the best test. Time will tell. Does she stick with us? Does she not? Do they go with the teaching? Do they go further than teaching the Christ? Do they turn their back on it? Well, time will tell. But otherwise, I'm just a, I don't know who you think I am, but I don't have any special, you know, magic or anything. I don't have any kind of, you know, put a couple of drops on their hand and they turn a certain color. And we automatically you know the litmus test, right? I don't got one of those. I don't even pass. I wasn't at seminary on that day. Were you, Pastor Greg? I don't think you were either. Both of us, you know, I don't know. Y'all made bad decisions about pastors. We don't have the stuff. I don't know. No, I'm sorry, that's not how it works. Those beside the road are those who heard. And we read that one. The rocky soul, verse 13. Are those who, when they hear, receive the word with joy. Emotional acceptance. Isn't it true that every person that cries has accepted Christ? No. Now here you have it right here. And these had no firm root. They believe for a while, and then in time of temptation, they fall away. How do you know they really didn't believe? Because they fall. That's how you know. And the seed which fell among the thorns, these are the ones who have heard, and they have gone on their way, and they have been choked by the worries and riches of this pleasure of this life, and they bring no fruit to maturity. The final group, it says, the seed in good soil. And these are the ones who have heard the word in honest and good hearts, and hold it fast, and bear fruit with perseverance. There you go, it's a key word, the perseverance of the saints. They hang on. How do we know the ones who are actually belong to Christ, the ones that hang on? But again, don't, don't mistake the power of the gospel. This is not a, power, there's not a problem with the power of the gospel. The power of the gospel is powerful. It, it just is. The person truly accepts they're in, they're never going to get out. It's not because of their holding power. It's not because they're superior. It's not because they're in the Baptist church, not in the Methodist church, or in the Catholic church, or not, not in the Presbyterian. No, it's got nothing to do with that. Is it, did they accept Christ or did they not accept Christ? Because if they did, they will persevere. Why? Because what, is it, what, is it, what does it say when a sheep makes it to its destination? Nothing about the sheep. Sheep are ignorant. They're dumb. They're defenseless. They can't do anything. They have no camouflage, but they're safe and healthy. They got there because they have a good shepherd. How are you going to make it? You and I, because we got a good shepherd. That's it. We have a shepherd that saved us. He gave his life for us. He shepherds us. He's never going to leave us. I'll never leave you, forsake you. He walks through us, and even in the valley of the shadow of the death, he goes with us, right? For thou art with me, right? So we're going to make it through because of the shepherd, not because of anything that we do. Real Christians hang on because the gospel hangs on to them. That's how it works. The real issue is not someone's power to believe. It's the power of the gospel to change and hold on to them. When someone falls away, it is not because of the weakness of the gospel 
or the weakness of the shepherd, it's because they have not come underneath either one. That's what's actually, again, they were never truly saved. That's why they can go and do the things they do. And I'm sure as a Christian, you've had some backsliding opportunities, done some stupid stuff after you became a famous Christian, right? Always with deep conviction, always with fear of God, always looking for a chance as quick as you could to come back to Christ. And there's others who just can fall away and like it doesn't ever bother them. Something's not right with them. Something's not right. It's called apostasy. That's what it's called. Eventually, they will fall away. Whether it's bad, whether it's sooner or later, they will. They begin to believe. They believe because it was going to make them feel better. It was convenient for them. Uh, it was going to get them out of trouble. It was going to make their marriage better. Uh, some other reason other than being saved from eternal, for, for, from eternal fire. If you believed in the wrong thing, you believed in the wrong person. That's what happened. That's why they fall away. There was no true root. There was no true faith. It's a very emotional belief for them, like I said, in many cases, uh, just as emotional when they turn away as well. It's interesting. This guy who I wrote about, who I told about, that 22 years old, writes this bestseller, uh, as a Christian pastor for many, many years. His, his, uh, you read his testimony of why he went away from the church. It's very emotional. It's very emotional. Uh, he did it for very emotional reasons. The gospel was hurting people, he said, hurting their feelings. He was hurting people that he loved, including the LGBTQ plus community. And he, uh, he wasn't being pressured by them, in all, all honesty. He just felt like it was not, the, the gospel wasn't nice to them. And so he quit Jesus over that. Quit his wife too. So that's what apostasy looks like. Uh, he left. So some fall away because they're distracted. That's the next group. That's the rocky soil, right? The weeds grew up. Uh, choked by the cares in verse 14 and pleasures of this life. They simply choose the easy life. Uh, you know, they thought Jesus was going to make things better for me and fun, and it turned out to not be so much fun, and we're denying myself, and I'm kind of not into that. So, so I left. That's what it boils down to. Uh, life was easier, and I had other things I needed to do, and so that's just simply what they did. Pleasures of temporary life over Jesus. They let go of their faith to get all that the world has for them. So, so there you go. There's a quick little rundown of what the New Testament has to say about apostasy. It's massive. It's, it's huge. So, so now what do we do? Where do we go from here? Right? What do we do now? I will say as, as a pastor and as a believer, and I'm sure it is true for you, when you hear these stories, it's discouraging. I mean, right? Who's encouraged by the fact that people are coming underneath the hearing of our ministries and then falling away. Part, part of the thing that encourages me to find out they were having the same problems in the New Testament. At least, I know worse than them, you know, at least we're having the same issues. I've seen people that just grieve my heart because I, you know, I don't know where they stand with Christ and they don't seem to, it doesn't seem to bother them at all. Uh, apostasy isn't like an illness that just uh, settles on a person out of the blue. This is, apostasy is something that is slowly builds in a person's life and then eventually they just simply poof, they're gone. And, uh, it's hard to come up with a remedy for that. So what can we do? Uh, if, if I had you, you know, had a whole congregation of a thousand people here today and I had you raise your hands, how many of you would like to follow, plan to fall away? There, nobody would. Who, wants, who plans to fall away, right? No one does. So, so how can we help ourselves? How can we help them? Well, number one, examine yourselves. So I thought we were talking about the apostates. Now let's talk about you for a minute. Second Corinthians 13.5. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. That's something personal that we all have to do. Test yourselves. Do you not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you? Very important question. So I thought if I go to church, I'm with Jesus. No, that's not true. I, I, I grew up in the church. That I'm a Christian. No, that's not true. Uh, my parents are Christians. No. I, I lived a good life. No, I'm not a Muslim or a Mormon or a Hindu, therefore I must be a Christian. Nope. That's the de default Christianity is not Christianity. Examine to see that Jesus is in you. Again, not that you know who Jesus is. Knowing who Jesus is, how does it make you better than the devil? We've said that a bunch. Uh, examine yourselves. Not because you served in the church either. Boy, talk about some sobering words that Jesus says here about apostates and especially those who minister and are apostates. Matthew 7 here. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. 
So what do you mean, Pastor Bill? I came up forward, I said, Jesus is my Savior, and you took me out to the Gulf of Mexico and baptized me, and I joined the church, and I was on committees. And, 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 and then now I'm all presenting this to Jesus, and Jesus saying, I never knew you. So what do I got to do to know Jesus? Yeah, you need to answer that question. Lord, not everybody says to me, Lord, Lord, or I accept Jesus is going to be with me in heaven, the kingdom of heaven. But he who does the will of my Father, how do you know what a saint is? They persevere. How do you know? Because of the way they live, ultimately. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied? These are ministry positions, aren't they? In your name. These are service positions in the church. Cast out demons in your name. That's a pretty high position. Done many wonders in your name. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You never came under faith in Christ. And so you're living as if you don't need Christ because you never accepted him. And so lawlessness just simply means you're, the law says you, you deserve to die and go to hell, and Jesus is the only Savior. You're not following the law. You're living a lawless life. You never come to Christ. Are you certain that you have Jesus? This is an important word. Uh, you repented of what you thought would save you and turned to Christ for forgiveness and rescue, because I'm telling you, that is the issue. So number one, examine yourselves. Number two, encourage yourselves. Encourage yourselves. When we get discouraged, we begin to entertain doubts, and uh, the solution is to learn to encourage ourselves. Not that we shouldn't seek encouragement from others, but ultimately, sometimes people just can't be there for you. Learn to encourage yourself. I, I uh, love this verse here in, in 1 Samuel chapter 30, verses 5 and 6. And David is running from Saul, and they've been on an adventure, and they left wives and kids and goats and chickens and goldfish behind in a city called Ziklag. And while they were gone, the Amalekites swept in. They were, they were raiding all the southern country in Ziklag's near the south. And they raid Ziklag and take every last person, every last article of clothing, every last thing. And when they come back, all the men who were part of David's fighting group, about 400 men, come back to find everything gone. So watch how they respond. Now David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him. He was a leader. That's what you do. You shoot your leaders when they mess up. <laughs> David, I mean, how could he have predicted this? Because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and his daughters, and I would say on their, on, as their protection, their wives as well. They were thinking about their wise lady, I'm just saying, you know, just we're trying to protect manhood here. But David, noticed strengthened himself in the Lord his God. Wow, because he didn't have a lot of support. These guys that were running with him were rabble-rousers and not really strong, if at all, in the Lord. David had a heart for God. And so how do you exist with no real fellowship? Well, it's not the best. You can do it, though. And I will say, under, the, under particular circumstances, you've got to do it. You've got to. You've got to encourage it. Stagnant faith is a devil's playground. Fill your heart, he, fill your heart with and mind with all kinds of doubts if you let him. And I'm telling you, a stagnant faith will certainly get you there. The worst thing you can do, ever do is put God on a shelf somewhere, put him on hold. That's a mistake. We're either growing, you're either going forward, or you're backing up. So you make yourself vulnerable. Strengthen yourself in the Lord. Uh, there's lots to be done. If we're thinking somehow that we're just going to get by somehow, we, we started well and we'll live off of how we started and we can just coast to the end, uh, you're going to find yourself in some difficult circumstances and lots of possibly deception and discouragement, to be sure. Uh, uh, if the only way to go, the guaranteed way to go backwards is to stop going forwards got to press on. Encourage yourself. Learn to encourage yourself. Paul puts it this way, Philippians. No, that's not Philippians. Hmm, I'm not even sure what that is. That's a great verse though. No, I, I was, there you go. I forgot, the, I forgot where I was. So, so the next one is exercise yourself. So here you go. Notice the exercise. 1 Timothy chapter 4, I just didn't scroll up far enough. But reject profane and old wives' tales. Why does it always have to be wives? I don't know. Wives' fables, exercise yourself towards godliness. Yourself. Exercise yourself, take personal responsibility. Godly exercise profits little. Not a reason not to go running, but, but godliness is profitable for all things, having promise of this life that now is, and of the one which is to come. Exercise 
yourself. Again, you find yourself on the sidelines, a a moving target's hard to hit. But sitting target's not hard at all. Make yourself a target. Don't do that. Exercise yourself. Move forward. Now we're ready for Philippians chapter 3, verses 13 through 14. One thing I do, Paul will talk about a guy who had to learn how to encourage himself, because boy, he was alone a lot. One thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forward to those things which are ahead. He's not coasting off of what happened in the back. He's not talking about his ministries of the past. He's focusing on what God has for him and what, what the future he has uh, in serving God. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus till the day he died. That was his attitude. It's got to be our attitude as well. We've got to press on. We've got to move on. If we sit, like I said, on the sidelines, we make ourselves a huge target. The book of Jude is, is, a, is, is pretty much 100% about this whole apostasy and what happens to those who apostatize and how we to keep ourselves and watch ourselves. And by the time Jude writes his book, this small book on the back, almost all of the original apostles have died, with the exception of John. Peter has died. Uh, James, the first, first martyr, uh, first of, of the apostles. Uh, Paul has been executed. Uh, Peter has been executed. James, his older brother, the half-brother of Jesus, who was the pastor of the church, the writer of the book of James, has been executed. Jude writes this book in some very dark times for the church. And he, he writes some things that are, on the, on the other hand, very encouraging. Notice what he says here in Jude 20 and 21. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith. Take responsibility for yourself. Build yourself up. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ in eternal life. I thought Jesus kept us in the faith. He does. But it doesn't let you coast. That means you're not an active participant in it. I'm just going to wake up and put the Bible under my pillow in the morning. I'm going to be much deeper in Christ. No, you won't. Exercise yourselves. Discipline yourselves. Build yourselves up. Keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. Keep yourselves, work yourselves. Again, speaking to believers here, it's possible to start out well loving Jesus and then realize somehow along the way, because you haven't done these things, that where's, what's happened to me? How did I get to where I am? Remember, return, and repent. We're going to see that here in Revelation. In fact, here it is right here, chapter 2. Nevertheless, I have this against you, Jesus writes to the Ephesian church. Some of you have left your first love. But what you were, how you served, how you were committed, you ain't that no more. Remember, therefore, where you have fallen and repent and do the first works, or else I will come to you and quickly remove and and quickly and remove your lampstand from its place unless you repent. He's talking about the effectiveness of the church and the effectiveness of a personal life serving God. And some of us have lost our, lost our lampstands because why? Because of neglect. It doesn't say we can't get it back. It just says we lose our influence and we lose our effectiveness because we've allowed things to fall backwards. He puts the responsibility on us. Again, who's holding us? Well, it is definitely God. But you and I have to press on. Jude tells us here, oops, forward, one more. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling. So wow. So yeah, I'm to keep myself, but great news is God's also keeping me at the same time, and I really need that because I'm not really strong. To present you faith faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty and dominion and power both now and forevermore. So yeah, keep yourselves, walk, work, serve, but also trust that, uh, yeah, you're not 100%. Nobody is, but he is. He definitely is. I'm going to end with a story about a a little girl by the name of Lee. And Lee was 12 years old and was enjoying long distance running because as a 12 year old, you can do do that. (laughs) And Lee loved to run uh, uh, short little, um, you know, 5K runs. And she was going to participate in this volunteer, young person's, and older person's volunteer. 5K run there in her community, and her mom goes and drops her off in the morning for this uh, run, not realizing, neither her nor her mom, that they were also starting at the same place, a different race. And she got in with the wrong race, 
And she realized she was in at the wrong race after, you know, 5K is 3.1 miles. She was at the four-mile marker. Something wasn't right. No, no end, you know, where's the finish line? And what happened was she didn't got involved. She got in for a three and a point one mile race. She got involved in a half marathon. And she wound up running that day, because kids can do that, 10 more miles than she planned to. And when she realized, like I said, about mile four or mile five, this is not a 5K. And so she just kept running. Because why? What else are you going to do? Just keep on running. That's what you and I need to do. We find ourselves in the race sometimes harder or longer than we thought it was. Keep running. Keep going. God, I lost the verse, but God is able to sustain you. It's okay, Jeff. God is able to sustain us. God's able to hold us. He's able to give us the power to do it. If we'll put one foot in front of us, that's our responsibility. God's not going to come and move your feet for you. But if we will move our feet... God will give us the power and emotions and, and ability, and we're able to get back up and continue to do what he's called us to do. We can't quit. Like I said, apostasy is discouraging. How could we preach? How could, but let me ask you something. How could you preach better than Jesus? Better than Paul? Better than John? Better than Peter? How can we do ministry better than them? So if they had people who were faithful parts of their church who fell away, oh, that's what we are. That's where we are. So we have to deal with it. One of, the, one of the things we cannot do is give up and get discouraged. We have to keep going. Because why? Because the power is in our presentation? No, because the power is in the Spirit of God that works through us as we faithfully serve. So we're going to stop. Do you have questions? Would someone like to borrow my book or have it and pass it on to somebody else? I would like to buy one. Okay, $100, Tom. Here you go. <laughs> <laughs> D, huh? Take I take Bitcoin. <laughs> explain it to me sometime and get a chance. Yeah, I bet. I'd love to explain it to myself. Questions? Uh, yes, ma'am. That's okay. And I know I invite people to church when those persons say, I want to go Sunday today. Yeah. But I call, I call, and she say she got uh, visit. Oh, yeah. People visit. Yeah. She come next time, but before I invite to her, she told me one day, I can't, I, I, I'm not going to church because I have the salvation. Right. I have baptist, like you say. Yeah. She said, I have the salvation, Mama. My right. Mama has the salvation. The weird, thought, weird people at the but, Baptist church, but right? I thought, is, 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 so it's there true. are. But, but if what you say is what you say, they have the salvation, but they can lose the salvation. Right. And, and people come up with excuses why they can't, and, or why they used to, and why they don't anymore. And I tell you, those are the things that break my heart the most, you know, being a pastor now for going on 30 years. Pastor Greg, 40 years. Uh, just had a 40 year anniversary. We've seen. A lot of people who just break your heart. I mean, but what you you can't do anything for them. I mean, how can you help them back? You can't say anything more than what you've already said. And so it's very frustrating. It is. But uh, we have to keep doing what we call to do: invite people, ask people, talk to people, witness to people, and trust that God's going to going to shake out uh, his his own flock. Something else? Yes, sir. Uh, the falling away. A, 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 a major, a major event, but obviously we're currently having that. We're currently having a falling away. So it isn't necessarily that happens something in the tribulation. It is. It is. Well, actually, I, the way I see it is prior to. It's sort of like the rise of the Antichrist. The, all these things are in my mind, at least the way I put it together, prior to the tribulation, the rapture of the church, the rise of the Antichrist, and the falling away is all prior to the tribulation. Because in the tribulation, as opposed to, you know, like I said, the feel-good preachers say, we're headed to glory right now. Now we're headed, you know, till the tribulation, we're headed downhill. The tribulation is going to be a massive revival for, the, for Christians, massive revival for people coming to Christ. A global, m tremendous. So does that make sense? Is, is that better explained? I, I think so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Because I, I was actually listening to uh, 
and it could be spaced out. It may be like happening all at the same time. It's just hard to look at it from where we are today and say for sure. But right. Well, um, the way you mentioned it, I thought well, maybe the rapture, because I think the rapture is going to tr- trigger things. Right. Like you're saying is is the falling away of those who who thought they were Christians left behind. Their falling away is that. <laughs> when I say falling away, could be part and parcel of it. Right. Yeah. Just. Uh huh. Could that be the falling away? Yeah. Not believers, right? Right. Right. They're going to be left, and so what's going to be the explanation for that? Yeah. That's very true. Something else? All right. Good to go then. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I'm juggling two or three things. I'm not doing all the things that he does because we don't have time. So I'm not really sure at this point. But I, as tomorrow night, I will know because I will be. I will work on it tomorrow. That's what I'm doing. <laughs> Make it a really good one. Okay. So I'll, I'll go through. I'll go through. Yeah, Dr. David Meyer has good days. He had bad days. I'll pick a really good one of his. So. So. Okay. Thanks for your time. Let's, let's, let's pray together. God, I, I thank you for uh, the word that you've given to us tonight. Lord, I thank you for its encouragement to us. And we do confess our, our broken hearts over those that we wonder about so much today. And uh, we pray that they're not apostates. We pray that somehow they just, there's going to be a second chance for them. And, and we're hoping for that, Lord. We're looking and I'm believing that, that their condition will somehow change. Uh, Lord, we pray for ourselves that we would continue to be encouraged and not be discouraged because uh, somehow placing the faith, our faith on, on our presentation or our, our uh, representation of the gospel, that somehow that makes the biggest difference. No, ultimately it's our dependence upon you. So Lord, we just want to recommit our dependence upon you and your power and your spirit and the truth of your word, and that is the, the power of God unto salvation for those who believe. And so, God, we're trusting that. It was true for us, and we pray it'll be true, continue to be true as, as we continue to endeavor to do the things you've called us to do. Thank you so much, God. Uh, keep us safe tonight, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks for visiting. Find us at www.islandbaptistchurch.org.